No. No, you're. Okay, so I'm sure you uh, like Professor Yao Corbell's lecture yesterday, so let's hear what he has prepared for today. Good, thank you. Um, uh, I hope you hear me well, uh, also uh, virtually. As yesterday, I start with a small activity because it's good to, you know, have a little brainstorming. This time, I'm asking you to um, um, write down the most unexpected or surprising application of entropy you have ever seen. So maybe in unexpected field. Uh, unexpected pleasure. So it can be in your field or in distant field, doesn't matter. So I again pass this, this post it and you have three minutes to write down your uh, most. And for names or doesn't matter. No, 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 we don't have to write names. Just with the, and, and for the virtual participants, you can write uh, your answers to the chat. Might be something you've seen this or last week, something you've seen during your research, something you've seen somewhere else at a conference. So if there is already somebody who finished their post-it, can again come, we will put it to this chart. Yeah, yeah, sure, come. And make me uh, uh, read it loud. Their generative algorithms in machine learning is the next one. I found in the theory of partial differential equations that a principle of maximal entropy follows to prove the existence and uniqueness of that group, mm -hmm. especially in convenient cases. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, information theory. Mm -hmm. In the meanwhile, I will look at the chat. So far. Okay, you can read it. Uh, it will also relate to the theory with the one. Mm -hmm. Um, so comparing the uh, conversability of matrices and information. Ah, okay. Yeah. Just... Yes, linguistics. Uh, in answer is analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, there is there any entropy about the two that quantifies uh, the dynamic and the, the loss in dynamic resolution and uh, the gain in statistical significance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, I'll read some um, chat uh, posts. So, Noor uh, is describing, uh, is saying that the most uh, interesting application is entropy of a black hole. This is definitely interesting. 
Su Yong is uh, referring to entropic force practice in chemistry. Yes. And Gilberto, uh, entropy played a major role in the modeling of peak interactions of visual signals in lizard retinas. Very interesting. Uh, dial using entropy in complex systems information theory. Good. Who else? I do have uh, black hole entropy. Black hole entropy, yes. Oh. Ah, okay. That there's an, an, an analog for rate of entropy production in first passage processes. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody else is still writing? But then there is the, the post its are somewhere. In So you can also write some if you want. No, I don't you mind. Applications a lot of uh, applications, a lot of uh, in in what you contribute with entropy in cybernetics. Com entropy in cybernetics, very interesting. Good, thank you all. Uh, these are all very interesting applications. Uh, I'll tell you mine that I came across. It's the entropy based adaptive sampling. What it means is that. If you want to create such a picture with this shiny um, metal structures or objects, what you do is that you do this ray tracing algorithm, which means that you specify your scene and you specify your source of, source of light. And then you basically randomly send a, a, a ray and follow it and, and see where it reflects where and, and where it's like, uh, and, and in this case, this paper uses some entropy-based uh, sampling of this source rays because the more the, the smarter you use this this uh, choice of your of your rays, the, the faster and better you get the the nicer solution. So this is one of the applications in image processing or like um, ray tracing, uh, but I've seen like many other applications in natural language processing, in uh, machinery, as was mentioned. Uh, I've seen also applications to analyze, uh, for example, law texts. So it's like, again, uh, let's say language processing, but um, there are so many applications of entropy and they are really all, uh, everywhere. Good. So I, I, the title of this talk is Let's Calculate Them. So I was promising you yesterday that I will show you some entropies that uh, we can calculate and that will be different from Boltzmann Gibbs Shannon entropy. Uh, and all this boils down to the fact that the Boltzmann entropy is equal to Gibbs entropy and Shannon entropy with this Boltzmann factor when the multiplicity or the sample space is, is multinomial. So when the multiplicity is multinomial, then we get uh, Shannon Boltzmann Gibbs entropy. But there are some examples of systems where the multiplicity is different, and then you get some different entropies. Um, maybe the simplest examples are uh, both Maxwell Boltzmann Fermi Dirac and Bose Einstein statistics. So this is something that you might already know from your statistics statistical mechanics courses, 
most of you know what is the Poisson's fermion distribution. Uh, however, you can show that there's an entropic function that uh, corresponds to these distributions that can be very easily calculated. So let's consider maxwell boltzmann statistics and we have n distinguishable particles and we have uh, ni particles of given energetic state, let's say epsilon i. And then the multiplicity, uh, it's kind of what we did yesterday, can be calculated. And here is another way how to calculate it is that I say I put ni particles to the first category, so n1 to the first category. From the rest, I choose the one to the second one. From the rest, I choose the, the others to the other one, and so on. So I start with n particles, I choose n1, and then from the rest, n minus n1, I choose n2, then from the n minus n1 minus n2, I choose n3, etc. etc. And then if you play with this a little bit, then you see that it's in a factorial over product of ni factorial. This is basically what we've seen yesterday. Then what you can think of is that if the if the epsilon i has the generosity g i, so it means that, that several states have different energy, like it, it can happen, then basically I for each state I have g i possibilities where I can put it. So then it's like uh, n factorial times g i to n i over n i factorial. And then we end with the regular uh, Shannon Boltzmann Gibbs entropy, where this g i is for the multiplicity. Okay, let's now uh, think about Einstein statistics. So we say, let's consider that these uh, particles are indistinguishable. And then basically uh, we have the uh, Ni particles in state epsilon i, the genocide GI. And uh, I am in a short using again, the stars and bars uh, theorem that uh, tell us um, how if, if I have, uh, and I particles and GI states, how many of uh, like boxes, how many of them I uh, like, what is the, the multiplicity of these state? And you can see that this is, this is the formula. And then by um, using the same procedure like yesterday. So basically I have this, uh, this uh, combination numbers. I express it in terms of factorials and then make a logarithm. Logarithm of product makes me sum of logarithms and the logarithm of n factorial is n of n minus n. I very simply end with this formula for the entropy. So this lambda i is g i over n. So this is the uh, relative degeneracy. Yes? Yeah, are we using a, an approximation here? Or so the, the regular sterling approximation. Just that, okay. Because I I think that in the Bolshevik statistics you always have to jump to the microcanonical tambour because you cannot do this. This is this is this is the micro micro uh, uh, yeah because we are some uh, yeah. this is this is microcanonical actually because we don't consider any any integration over energetic state so here exactly, okay. it's it's microcanonical yeah. yeah so 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 yes so that, that's exactly the case okay. So, and you see that, that it's kind of similar to the Boltzmann entropy. So, so this, this term is the same like for the Boltzmann case, but there is this uh, additional alpha i and uh, also this alpha i. This is the basically constant term alpha i log alpha i, but this is the term that, that changes the whole statistics. Uh, good. Uh, what about Fermi Dirac statistics where I have? Uh, and indistinguishable particles, uh, but maximally one particle can be uh, in, in, in one sublevel, which means that, that the Ni must be smaller than Gi. Then basically, and again, just simple combinatorics that you see that in the, in the combination number, it's not Ni plus Gi minus, one, but it's maximally GI. So basically I have to have maximally one particle at each state. And this leads to this formula that is product of I goes to one to K over this uh, combination numbers. And then again, the same story, expressing combination numbers in terms of factorials, taking the logarithm, which makes the sum. And then against the formula, 
and we end with very similar uh, equa uh, equation for, for entropy, like on the previous slide, but with few minuses, if you, if you remember. So it's really different in a few minuses, but this difference is, you know, very important because then the whole difference between the Einstein distribution and Fermi direct distribution is very big. We will discuss it in the next talk when we a little bit discuss the maximum entropy distributions. Good. So this is this is these are the examples you might already know from the your courses on statistical physics. Now I go to maybe a little bit more um, not so well known examples of entropies of systems where they are, there are no, um, not, not in the case of, uh, they are not described by Shen uh, or like Botswana Gibson trophy. And we come back to yesterday a little bit. So if they had the um, dices and we're throwing dices here, I make it a little bit simpler. I have coins. So we throw coins, those coins. And uh, these have each coin, let's say have two states, head and tails. If it was like that, then we ended with uh, with a uh, multinomial factor, and we ended with Shannon entropy. But let's make a small change. Let's say that these coins can be magnetic. They are magnetic, and they can bond together. So they basically stick together and create one bond state. This is something you can think of as maybe atoms creating molecules or uh, coral particles creating um, clusters uh, or, or polymers or something like that, or even people forming groups. And it seems like a small difference, but actually you can show that the state space grows faster than exponentially. So what it means, it means that if you express the, the, the multiplicity in terms of the number of coins, then you end with n to n, which is actually e to n of n. And normally you would get something like two to n if you have coins. And now there's the question, so is it very different, the two to n versus two to n of n? And the question is, yes, it is a big difference because you will see that in large n, the bound states will basically have the most, will be the most common states. So the states where the particles are free are then very much suppressed by this. And this is this is a picture that is by, from a nice paper by Henrik Jensen and his colleagues who started to play with this simple model and discovered that um, the thermodynamics of this model is really a uh, bit more complicated that, uh, than, than we thought before. Good. So we know uh, how to calculate the multiplicity and or what is the multiplicity. So it's basically the, the number of metal states, uh, the number of microstates uh, that correspond to one metal state. So here we have a metal state, let's say two uh, coins head, two head, two heads, and one tail. And we know that the microstates can be head, tail, head, tail, head, head, or head, head, tail. So basically the multiplicity uh, is uh, three of this metal state. Uh, similarly, if we think of um, one coin in head and one and, and two other coins are, are bound, then basically it's easy to, to, to calculate that, that the multiplicity is three again, because this can be like head and the second and third are in this bound state or first or second are in this bound state or third and third are in this bound state. Now how to calculate the multiplicity. So for this case, again, we will be permitting all the particles or all the coins, but again, we will have to take care of overcounting. So basically if, we, if this are all the six permutations of the three coins, we see that the states one, two, three, and one, three, two, are the same microstates. So basically now what we do is that we take three factorial because this is the number of all the combination of all the permutations. And then we have to divide by two factorial. For this case that I have to 
care, take care of these permutations between two head states. So we see that, and similarly for the case of when we have one head and uh, one bond state, then the two, the, the one, two, three, and one, three, two, these are the same states. And so it means that in both cases here by chance, uh, it's three factorial over two factorial, which is free. And now how to do it in general. So let's have an IJ, I would call it now molecules of size J and that are in, in given state. So basically we do the all, all these uh, permutations, which gives us n factorial. And then first we have to mm -hmm. take care of all the permutation of the molecules. So, so here, if molecules of size three, then it's the three factorial, six permutations. And then we also have to take care of the permutations of particles in the molecules. So in the molecules, we have to also take care of this um, permutation. So, so for each molecule, we have the three factorial because this is the molecule of size three and we have three molecules. So basically it's a uh, three factorial to third. In general, so, so, yes. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's like I, I should think that these um, balls have like labels, and you can. Yes, exactly. So, so you would say the molecule has the label. This is the first molecule, second molecule, third molecule. But actually, doesn't doesn't make any difference if I call this first one, second one, third one, or any other one. Mm -hmm. And the same is within the molecule. I can label the particles in the molecule as first one, second one, third one, but it doesn't matter. So I have to really take care of this overcounting. Okay. So here you see that uh, the total multiplicity is given by nine factorial over three factorial times three factorial to three, which is 280. And the general formula is that you take n factorial over the product of an nj factorial. This is something we already saw in the multinomial factor. But then there is additional factor of J factorial, which is the size of the molecules done uh, to the NIJ. And NIJ is number of these molecules. So, and now I will be displaying in red, the difference between the, what we have for multinomial factor and channel entropy and what we have in this case. So we do the same story. Uh, yeah, before that, I have to say that this seems to be relatively new, although, it's been already discussed by Boltzmann. And let me switch off these titles. Can I uh, switch them off? Okay. So here, yeah, yeah, let me just move that. So here, Boltzmann in his 1884 paper, which is unfortunately in German, but he's interested in chemical reactions of chlorine and hydrogen, what's which of is hydrogen, uh, that makes the reaction to make the chlorohydrogen. And basically this Z, this is the multiplicity. This is the Zustandsumme in German. This is exactly the formula I showed you before. Uh, so he already was discussing this, um, this structure forming entropy. Unfortunately, uh, later it was later discovered by Gibbs uh, that you can do it by the ground chemical ensemble, which is eventually easier. Um, so then this, this has been somehow forgotten. But in case where you are really interested in exact numbers of molecules, especially for a small system, so if you have only a few dozen of molecules, then this is the formula that applies. Uh, so by taking the formula and doing the exactly the same thing like before, so uh, using the, the logarithm, change the, the product for the sum and using Stirling's formula, we get that the, the log of the multiplicity, the entropy is equal to n log n minus n. Here, the, the, n, the, the nij, doesn't sum up to n, I will discuss it a bit later. Uh, and plus this red uh, factor is this nij log j factorial. And now we introduce probabilities, pij, and I call it probabilities in quotation marks because if you think about it, they, are, they don't sum up to one. 
Why? Because NIJ is number of molecules. Uh, so if you if you sum up the number of molecules, it doesn't sum up to one because you have to for each molecule you have to multiply by the number of particles in the molecule so that you get the total number of particles. So it means that this sum NIJ, uh, which is the total number of molecules, is always small or equal to the number of particles. So here we we can write it in terms of probabilities, but this is a bit easier to um, to work with. So we have this kind of probabilities that do not sum up to one. So here, the first thing is that this minus one uh, after the log P remains there. So it's not canceled because of this not lack of normalization. And here we have this additional term that depends on, this is the PIJ and this is the constant that depends on the, on the size of the molecule. Uh, we can do then so-called finite interaction range if we say it's not every particle can um, interact with each other molecule, but let's say we have uh, B boxes and in the boxes, the particles can interact with each other, but not between the boxes. Then we get this effective concentration C, which then plays the role of, uh, of the number of molecules in the box. So that's another example. Uh, tomorrow, again, I will show what are the consequences for thermodynamics. But you see that this formula, again, kind of similar to, to Boltzmann uh, Gibbs Shannon formula, but not exactly the same. Do you have some any question to this example? Then I try to do yet another example. This system is called sample space reducing process. It was introduced by my colleagues, um, uh, Bernard Koromina Smutra, uh, Rudy Hanel, and Stefan Turner. And the idea is quite simple. So let's have a staircase. Say we have a staircase and we have a ball, but the ball can only jump down the, stair jump down, down the staircase. So once I go from nine, let's say to this five, I cannot go back. I have to, I have to come, come to this ground state, and then only in the ground state, the, the ball is driven back to the to, to a random state. Uh, so it's like um, the relaxation part where you go down, and the driving part where you go up. But these are not. Uh, there's a certain kind of asymmetry. This system is interesting because it leads to so-called uh, Zipf's law, so that the visiting probability is then one over i, approximately. And also interesting part is the entropy of this system. So let's think about how we calculate the multiplicity. So let's consider a sequence of uh, where we go down and end in the ground state. So we start in a random state, do a few steps down, and then end in the ground state. So this is one sequence for us. For each sequence, we calculate the multiplicity of this sequence. And how we do that is that, so let's have a number of states, and it's number of states, so number of steps, steps coming from n to one. So basically this series of states goes Xn to X1 and we have a sequence. And uh, let's say we sample R, R relaxation sequences. And now we can visualize it as follows. So basically this is the, the first sequence. And the, if there is a star, then the ball appears in the state. If there is this uh, pause, then it doesn't appear. And what we can see is that in any state that we see here, then it can or doesn't have to appear in, in the state except for the ground state. So it must appear always in the ground state. So basically it's like something, 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 ground state. Something, 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 ground state. And the question how many of these sequences contain uh, this state xj exactly three times. So if you have R sequences, how many of them contain, uh, uh, contain the state xi exactly k times? This is easy because then we can see that the state time has to be 
uh, has to appear in R sequences k times. So then basically, and since the number of runs is equal to k1, so the number of uh, the times that the ball appears in the ground state, then basically the multiplicity is k1 uh, over uh, kj, because kj times it must appear and the total number is k1. So it's just a combination number because it can appear in any of these. And we can then for each state, we can then the total multiplicity is that we multiply this multiplicity for each state. So it's this product of k1 over kj. And then uh, again, the same trick, we apply the logarithm, which makes the sum from the product and then uh, use the Stirling's formula. Here we see that some terms change a uh, little bit. Then what we do is that we uh, at and this the, the um, at and subtract this kj k log k1 because of the it makes the, the the formula nicer. And then we introduce this again the probability pi. This is the k over n when n is the total number of steps, and we get this formula where we have this pi log pi over p1 uh, p1 minus pi log pi over p1 and this kind of um if we come back it's kind of similar to the case of Fermi Dirac statistics where there was not p1 but there was this this alpha j this multiplicity and if you plug in the multiplicity where is where, where it's some some somewhere one versus zero you get very similar formula to that so this is very interesting because what you get here is that this entropy has for each state it's somehow entangled with the ground state. So then basically what you will see when we do the maximum entropy principle that each state will be somehow entangled with the P1 state. So this is again yet another formula that describes the multiplicity of the process that is now history dependent because now it's, it, it's not just about the state itself, it's about the history. So do you have some questions? If not, well, I, 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 I'll have a look. Chat, doesn't seem so. Do we start to go? Yeah, yeah. So another example. Poya Arn. Um, here I have to say I was learned quite aggressively by my Hungarian friends that name of this mathematician is not Poya but Poya, so just that you know. Um, the Poya urn is a simple system. So basically, you have a you have a let's say uh, a box with balls of different colors, and each time you basically choose randomly one ball from this box, look at the color, and then for the next round, you basically put back delta of balls of the same color. And then you draw again, and, and you then again put back delta same uh, balls. So it means that the number of the total number of balls increases, but also the ratio of the balls changes during, during the, the rounds. And the, we are interested in the limit when the runs are very long. So in the infinite time limit, then the number of balls is infinite. And the question is what happens with the ratios of these balls, uh, whether some color wins or whether there is some uh, stable ratio of the colors. So again, in th this was, uh, this multiplicity was, um, discuss in this paper. Um, so let's just think about the probability of the sequence. Now I do not talk about multiplicity of the sequence, but probability, the probability is just the multiplicity over the total multiplicity uh, over the total possibilities. Here I do it because it's more convenient, but it's basically the same uh, situation then we I will not have to divide by n the, the final result. So basically let's say we have ni 
balls of color CI, and we have C different colors, so red, green, blue, whatever. And after the ball is drawn, we return delta balls of the same color to the urn. And after n draws, you can think it's easy to think that uh, the number of balls in the urn is ni plus delta chi, ki, where ki is the number of, of the draws of the ball of a ball of that color i, ci or ci here. And of course, the total number of balls is growing. So it's n, which is the initial one plus delta n. Uh, the, no, there should be not be n, but there should be small n. So the, the so the first n is the lowercase n, and this n is the, the this one. Sorry. Uh, so and now the probability of drawing a color ci in nth run is this n i n over n capital N, uh, and this this we have this this formula here. And then the property of the sequence is basically the product of over the all cars where I introduce this um, notation that M delta R is M times M plus delta plus M times two delta plus M times, etc. And it makes sense because once I draw, once I draw a color, next time I draw a car, I basically draw it from K plus, uh, the uh, from the number of balls that are increased by delta. So first time I do it from ni, second time I draw, I, I do it from ni plus delta, third time I draw, I do it from the ni plus two delta, etc. Okay, so then this is this is the probability of drawing the sequence, but the sequence is not the histogram. So the histogram is now just you know how many times I draw uh, each color. And you can think about it that it means that uh, the multiplicity is that since I have the sequence for the given sequence is that the, like the histogram is, is from uh, related to the sequence by the regular multinomial factor as, as before. Now the trick is that we also have the probability of the sequence. So here you can think about it like, now, uh, if if I had a sequence before, then this sequence, each sequence had the same prior probability of being of being uh, being chosen. So, for example, if I have the dice, so then the prior probability of of from a sequence is the same. Here, I have the change of the probabilities of drawing the sequence, uh, and this changes then the. The, uh, the the entropy. So basically, I can um, decompose the multiplicity into the multiplicity of the histogram times probability of seeing that histogram. And of course, for some cases, the probability of seeing the histogram is uniform, or, or like a multiplicity of the histogram uh, given the sequence, and then probability of seeing that sequence. When the sequ when the probability of seeing that sequence is uniform, then I can forget it because then it's a con just constant. If it's not constant, then it gives me this extra factor. And here, what you get is that actually uh, this probability, you see that um, I use this, and then we, I don't want to go to technical details, but the NIJ is basically this KJ factorial times uh, some other terms. So you see that this kg factorial coming from the multinomial factor here nicely cancels with this kg factorial coming from this, this uh, probability of seeing that, um, that, uh, that sequence. So then uh, if you do a bit technical calculation, I don't want to go to the detail, you end with this entropy that is uh, sum of log pi plus one over n. So you see that it's not P log P, but just log P. So although it seems to be very similar to Schenner entropy, this has very different consequences as we see next time uh, for the, for example, maximum entropy distribution. Are there any questions? Yeah. Is there any real system to which this is applicable? Like you mean physical system? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, you might. I, 
not aware of any of that the systems like real physical systems you would need to have this part this control of particle influx this is more like a system that you can think about not any real physical system i would say but a good question maybe i will look at the chat no nothing so then uh and then the last example I take, because this is something that has been quite a lot uh, discussed uh, in this, co this our community with Telmer and other people. This is what is called generalized entropies. And this is rather a theoretical example. So it's, I, I don't have an example, simple example of a system. What I will do is, let's say, theoretical approach when I try to deform this multinomial factor. Uh, but it can be useful hint of what happens if there are correlations in the in the sample space. So the motivation can be that uh, what we have is uh, exponential function, and we can define it as a limit of one plus x over n to n. And let's say uh, for some reason we don't want to take the limit, but we consider a finite version of this exponential and logarithm and uh, people call it Q exponential, then they don't use the N, which is the, the this number of, uh, let, let's say, uh, in, of the series. So it's the, the, the notion of the each term in the series, but they use this Q. So they define this Q exponential as one plus one minus Q times X to one over one minus Q. And in the case where you send Q to one, you get the ordinary exponential function. Uh, and then you can do the following. So you can define the inverse function, which is this log the Q logarithm, which is the one uh, X to one minus Q minus one over one minus Q. And then I try, we can find operations that have the same properties as exponential. So basically we want to say, is there an operation that uh, is generalized product of uh, Q exponentials is the same like uh, sum of exponential of a sum. So we know that uh, sum of exp uh, product of exponentials is exponential of a sum. Uh, it turns out that you can find out such an operation um, and it's called Q product and it looks like that. So it's like this A to one minus Q plus B to one minus Q minus one uh, to one over one minus Q. In all cases where you send Q to one, you need to take typically L'Hopital rule and then you end with regular uh, product. Uh, good, so what we can do now is that we can say, okay, so I have n factorial, which is one times two times three times, and, and we saw that it's because probably uh, if you do some combinatorics, then at the beginning you have n possibilities, then you have n minus one possibilities, you have n minus two possibilities, et cetera. So basically then what uh, these guys, uh, um, it was done by uh, Hiroki Suyari from Japan. What he um, like proposed is that we can generalize this, that we say is the Q factorial of N, which is this N Q product two, Q product three, Q product, uh, et cetera, to N. And this doesn't look so nice, of course, uh, but maybe it's uh, good to show that the Q log of Q Factorial n is this uh, sum of k to one minus q minus n over one minus q. And if you think about it, it's a nice, um, nice generalization because the the n log n minus n. So if you think about this, it's n. So this sum over one minus q. If you take the 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 the, the, the limit, and it's like k log k. So uh, this can be used for uh, defining the Stirling's approximation here. So basically what you find out is that this Q log n factorial, Q n factorial is approximately n Q of n. And then we can generate the uh, multinomial factor to say, let's make everything deform because we liked it for some reason. And, but, then if you calculate, it starts making some sense because then you see that, that this is this, this sums over L to one minus Q. And how you can think about it is that 
maybe not all the combinations in the state space are possible. Maybe some of them are uh, forbidden from some reason that is not clear now. So maybe this is how I can describe systems where some combinations are not possible from some reason. And then what I get is that um, I have this, uh, that the, 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 the multiplicity is given by a skew multinomial factor. And in this case, we can again use the Boltzmann formula with the logarithm, but it seems more possible to use this Q algorithm because we have these nice properties. So yeah, then uh, it's not directly comparable, but what we get is the so-called Thales entropy, where the Thales entropy is this PI two minus Q minus one over Q minus one. And sometimes there is this duality between Q and two minus Q is another debate. What is interesting is that you see that this Thales entropy, this prefactor, this N uh, is not, Typically, in all previous cases, there was n times something in probabilities. Here it is n to two minus q, something in probabilities, which is called not non-extensivity, non which means that it doesn't grow linear system size, but uh, as a n to two minus q, this is something that will be discussed later. And whether it's useful or not, uh, we will see. Um, and yeah, so. Until now, maybe is there a question or something? I have a question from online. Yes, please. What, what is the physical meaning of uh, this uh, Q, Q deformation? So uh, there is, in my opinion, not like clear, simple physical meaning, but people use this size entropy in many applications because of the correlated systems. I will discuss that in uh, the the other talks. So basically what you can show is that if, if there are some interesting intrinsic correlations in the system, then it leads naturally to a size entropy. Unfortunately, this approach where you calculate uh, the entropy from the, from the uh, multiplicity, this is not very much uh, intuitive. So I am sorry, but I can give you a simple example. This is really well, more like- on, on the chat room, uh, Gilbert, or commented something that sounds interesting that this transformation comes when random variable from non-Gaussian is mapped into normally distributed meaning Gaussian. Might be, might, oh yeah, this space box box transformation, yeah, yeah, it might be the case. I would need to, to look at it a bit more carefully, but it might be interesting, yes, yes. Oh, I see. Thank you, okay. Gilberto. All right, thank you. And there was another question. Sorry, uh, in the first sli uh, slide on Q deformations. Yes. Um, this, uh, the, the very last equation, the A pro uh, Q product D, yes. uh, is this expression and, um, uh, where did this expression come from? Uh, you by, by, by basically, um, by basically um, saying that I require that this, I, I look for the, the the operation such that it fulfills this this property one line above. So that's, yeah. Good. And now, uh, uh, so up to now, there was no thermodynamics in, in, in that. It was just mm -hmm. counting the states, but what we are interested in, in connection with thermodynamics, are there might be something in the chat? Yeah, good. Um, is the relation to energy, of course, because we are interested in, so states have energy, and this gives us some um, intuition about how the energy is um, dissipated or like, uh, Change like exchange between the bath and the and the system. So basically, we consider this that the states describe the energy of the system. It can be either the Hamiltonian or it can be like more general energy from functional. In case of Hamiltonian, we need to have this canonical coordinates. But in other systems that are maybe described another way, it can be a general energy functional because just just a function that that gives a number to to every state. 
And then we use the Boltzmann formula. So the D, so the S is basically the logarithm of this multiplicity. So the multiplicity is number of states having given energy. And um, then, as you know, uh, there are a few we call ensembles. So it can be a few situations. So isolated system, uh, which we call microchemical ensemble, which means that you have just the system and nothing else. So it means that, that the total energy of the system is, is constant. So basically then it means that, that if we have the multiplicity of E is the number of states that of, of the microstates having this, this energy. And you might know that it's connected with the phenomena, with phenomena like negative temperature. So if you have the spin systems where um, you have the microcanonical ensemble that you can observe uh, negative uh, absolute temperatures and these things. I don't want to go to many details uh, because for most of the applications, uh, it's more interesting to have a canonical ensemble, which means that we have a closed system, which means that, that the particles of the systems are uh, somewhere in box, for example, and we have a system of interest and the bar, and the bar, we don't care. So we care only about the energy of the system. So what we do is that we integrate over our cost rate over the bar, and we make an assumption that the bar is much larger than the system, so the bar is always in equilibrium. In other way, uh, you can say that the state of changing the state of the system doesn't change the state of the bar. So they are in, independent. And, and of course, one uh, thing is that they might, must be weakly coupled. So I must be able to write the total energy as the sum of the, the two energies. If they are strongly coupled, then the situation is different and it's much more complicated. I will not go uh, to the details, but there is also a theory for strongly coupled uh, systems and the bar. And then, of course, uh, the, the total energy is the sum over the states and the, so the system states and the buff states uh, and this delta function between the total of Hamiltonian and total energy. And then uh, there is uh, another, yet another approach called open system, gram canonical ensemble, which means that also there is a particle reservoir where system can exchange particles. I, there is some, typically some, um, Confusion between like uh, between what is called isolated system, closed system, open system. So I my definition is is the following. Some uh, people can uh, define it in a different way. So that if you read other papers, then you see maybe other definitions. Now I'm interested mostly in the canonical ensemble because I want to show you what's then the entropy. And basically, it means that I calculate this this multiplicity. So what I can do is that I say, since the, the total entropy is constant and the total, uh, the total energy is constant and the total energy is the energy of the bath plus the energy of the system, I say, let's consider that the system has some energy and the bath has the, the, the rest of the energy. And I say, I integrate over all this uh, the system uh, energy. So basically what I can do is because of this, this weak interaction, I can divide the delta function into the, 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 the delta function for the system and the delta function for the bath, which then uh, is useful because this double sum over the states of the system and the bath can be decomposed into the sum times the delta function. So this is just about the system and this is just about the bath. So then, the multiplicity, the total multiplicity is the multiplicity of the system having energy ES and the bath having energy E dot minus T S and I have to integrate over this. And this is typically very hard to calculate. So what people do is that the, they consider only the dominant, dominant contribution from the integrand. So they take, they, they consider, they, they calculate when this uh, term is maximal. So basically then what you uh, impose is that take the partial derivative with respect to ES and set it zero, which then leads to this equation. And if you think about this, this is the, der this is the, the derivative of entropy because entropy is log of the multiplicity over ES. And this is nothing else than the temperature. So then this is why the temperature of, uh, of the bath and the systems are the same 
in equilibrium because the equilibrium is actually the state that maximizes this, this contribution. And then basically this, this SB, this second term, the log of this WB, this is the free entropy because it's the entropy minus the T times uh, one over T times T uh, times ES. So this is the, the one over T minus one over T times free energy. This is called free entropy. Sometimes also you can uh, hear the name Massier function. And this is where the maximum entropy emerges. Uh, we can also see it from the point of core graining that uh, we have a system and we have a much larger bath. And in this case, we have the deterministic picture because you can say, for example, I have the Hamiltonian system. So the, the, total, the total evolution is Hamiltonian. However, uh, I'm either not interested in, to, in the bath's evolution or I cannot describe it or they are too, it's too large. So in case, if, if it's really very large, I can do this course graining. This is what we did with this approach. And I have this statistical picture there that there is the basically the, the system of interest coupled to the bath that we basically model by this temperature. And that's it for today. Uh, then again, I ask you uh, if you have some questions or if there is something that was interesting to you, surprising or something that you didn't know, something that uh, you don't agree with. Is there something like that? Yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah, so basically this is really the, so in this case, it's really just the toy model of a ball going down the stairs. But more generally, this can be a good model for systems that do not follow. So for detailed ones, I come to that later. So basically it tells us that there is some kind of symmetry between relaxation and driving. And in some systems it can be that the symmetry between relaxation and driving is broken. And that this can be then effective theory for describing these systems. Here it's really, uh, I wanted to have a very simple example uh, that you, know, you can imagine. But uh, so in this case, it doesn't represent any real physical system. So it's really just a toy thing. Here I have something from the chat. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, any other question? Then if not, I think I had a bit earlier, but I think you don't mind. So enjoy your evening and yeah, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.